Oh, hi there. My name is Vladislav Radek. I'm a writer and mathematician. And you probably already know that. Weird combination, you might say, and you wouldn't be necessarily wrong. But which of those two I am more? I spent decades educating myself in mathematics only to use my scanty free time to try to write novels that might change the world. And I had a little bit of success on both sides. But here is the interesting thing. When I'm on my uh, scientific conferences, nobody ever asks me about my writer's career. While on the other side, when I'm promoting books and when I'm on a book tour, journalists often ask me about my Mr. Jekyll and Dr. Hyde moment, trying to see if I use mathematics to make my thrillers and horrors a little bit more complex and a little bit more layered out. And most of them, they don't forget to mention that I must be a modern renaissance man. Renaissance man, polymath, polyhistor, so much frivolity and triviality behind those expressions. They do nothing more just to sell maybe blogs and newspapers, put a little bit pressure on writers and creators and make some disappointment in readers. Okay, when I'm not writing books, I teach at university and I often quote Hollywood movies trying to explain some natural phenomena. And when I'm trying to crack some theorem in mathematics and it doesn't really work, I turn to my piano and try to compose something in order to clear my brain and lay out something new. But the Renaissance man? <laughs> I don't think so. Can Renaissance man even exist today in this modern society that oftenly values people ability to focus on one thing and one thing only and to perfect that until retirement kicks in. Can we even wander around and ask questions outside of our profession and outside of our fields without being judged? And is there a way to learn something from history that can make us a little bit more curious, investigative and a little bit more diverse in everything what we do in our lives? To discover more, I'm taking you to Florence, Italy to retrace the steps of one and only Leonardo da Vinci. We will study his notes, go to his museum and try to determine which things made him so versatile and so brilliant and can any of those things can be applied today. Let me take you on an adventure. The scorching hot sun of Florence, Italy welcomed my crew and me, reflecting to the centuries-old cobblestones on the streets where some of the greatest minds of human history walked before me. Leonardo da Vinci was many things. An artist, an architect, an engineer and theoretical producer. But he was also gay, legitimate, and widely popular in Renaissance era Italy. Today, we use the term genius to describe everything from pop star to a football player, even stand-up comedian. But he was a different type of genius. From classical paintings like Mona Lisa and The Last Supper, to groundbreaking studies for flying machines, optics and perspective, Leonardo da Vinci fused art and science to create works that would become an integral part of humanity's story. But can a modern man be a true polymath, true renaissance man in society doesn't reward multidisciplinary approach but rather specializing in fields so narrow that even most devoted individuals sometimes feel suffocated and claustrophobic in their art studios, research labs or other facilities. This is why we came here to beautiful Florence to retrace the steps of one and only Leonardo da Vinci and in footnotes of history discover is there any possibility of true modern multidisciplinary man. Leonardo was born in modest village Vinci out of the wedlock to his father respected notary Piero and Caterina, a local peasant girl in the spring of 1452. 
being an illegitimate son, it was considered almost impossible to follow the steps of his father and become a notary one day, which certainly allowed Leonardo to be freer spirited and creative during his youth, explore his fascinations with different fields and professions. And he would be a terrible notary. He got bored and distracted easily, especially when tasks become more routine rather than creative. Being an illegitimate possessed a limbo of conflicting laws and feelings. Young Leonardo was free to choose his paths, but his inheritance will vanish. And laws were not on his side, as later he would discover by being accused of having an intimate relationship with another man which carried a prison sentence in this time. Instead, not being tied by laws and traditions, young Leonardo realized that his universe needed to be created by himself on the very edge of society, feeding and nurturing his passions and talents with like-minded people. A 19th century cultural historian Jacob Buckerhead described Renaissance Italy as golden age for bastards. When he moved to Florence at the age of 12, this city under the patronage of Medici family became a fertile ground for people with diverse talents. Silk workers worked with gold beaters to create enchanting fashion, architects worked with artists to develop the science of perspective, shops became art studios and merchants became financiers. Leonardo's father made sure that young Leonardo gets good basic education as well as apprenticeships. One of those led him to discover the work of Filippo Brunelleschi, the designer of magnificent cathedral dome. To build this dome, a self-supporting structure of close to 4 million bricks that is still the largest masonry dome in the world, Brunelleschi had to develop sophisticated mathematical modeling techniques and invent an array of hoists and other engineering tools. According to his biographers, he experimented with a wooden panel divided into squares, a separate plaque with a hole in the middle and a set of crosshairs. He would look uh, through the plaque in the hole on the eye level and see what every square of this beautiful facade represents and try to copy it into a painting exactly what he saw grid by grid, square by square. At the end, the ending drawing was amazing and accurate perspective. To compare his accuracy, he would place a mirror that would reflect the facade of the building next to his painting. The observer would see a striking similarity between the reflection and the objects he drew. After accomplishing this trick on a painted panel, he showed how parallel lines seem to converge in the distance toward the vanishing point. His formulation of linear perspective transformed the art and also influenced the science of optics, the crafts of the architecture and uses of Euclidean geometry. Standing on the shoulders of the giants, Leonardo noted that in order to master one skill, he needs to elevate knowledge of different fields, both from art and science perspective. One ability that he always emphasized was how to draw analogies between cases, a method that he would repeatedly use in later science. Analogies and spotting patterns became for him a rudimentary method of theorizing. Leonardo's visual perception was driven by his abiding faith in nature's design, whether a tree root or a flight of the bird. Human ingenuity, he wrote, will never devise any inventions more beautiful nor more simple, nor more to the purpose than nature does. Because in her inventions nothing is wanting, nothing is superfluous. A gifted musician, Leonardo researched acoustics, sang and improvised melodies on his lira de brasio, that is bowed renaissance string instrument. He also designed a range of musical instruments including drums, bells and woodwinds. Here, he brainstormed ideas for a keyboard string combination known as viola organista. Slavomir Zubritsky, who later built a viola organista, claims Leonardo designed a perfect instrument. His mind concepts never stopped dancing around the line between ingenuity and fantasy. Still, his public reasoning was often genius, hiding his artist dreamer alter ego wisely behind the society's needs. In his job application to assist the ruler of the city, Ludovazio Sforza, he mentioned his engineering skills, pointing out his ability to construct complex war machines, knowing Milan's inclination toward military power. Leonardo mentioned none of his paintings, neither did he refer to his talents in art creating a theater or music.
Lack of inspiration for picking up the brush led him to fantasize about being accomplished weapons designer. He was never in the battle, but his promises were never fully hollow. Upon his arrival to Milan, he would borrow many books on military engineering and embark on the quest to design some extraordinary designs for weapons, armory and military transportation. Those investigations led him to be the first one to propose the propounding laws of proportion, how one quantity such, for example, force, rises in proportion to another, such as the length of the lever. A supersized crossbow, for example, if correctly constructed, will be able to hurl projects that were bigger or went further. In his studies, he tried to figure out the correlation between the bowstring that was pulled and the force it exerted on the projectile. The giant crossbow was never built until a group of engineers tried to recreate it in the TV special in 2002. It didn't work, making it one of the many Leonardo's projects that will end up and the pile of unfinished being incorrect and abandoned for the lack of focus. Yet, not this nor any other failures discouraged Leonardo to move forward and further. He would often keep notes on his progress, motivation and doubts. As you go about town, he wrote in one of them, constantly observe, note and consider the circumstances and behavior of men as they talk and quarrel or laugh. According to the poet Giovanni Battista Giraldi, whose father knew Leonardo, when Leonardo wished to paint a figure, he would first consider what social standing and emotion it was to represent, whether noble or plebeian, joyful or severe, troubled or serene, old or young, irate or quiet, good or evil. And when he made up his mind, he went to places where he knew that people of that kind assembled and observed their faces, their manners, dresses and gestures. And when he found what fitted the purpose, he noted it in a little book he was always carrying in his belt. What is left of Leonardo's notes is around 7200 neatly packed pages of what is probably less than a quarter of notes which Leonardo left behind. His notebooks have been rightly called the most astonishing testament to the powers of human observation and imagination ever set down on paper. He was exceptional in his broad to-do lists. I wrote some of my favorites down. He said in his notes, the measurement of Milan and all of its suburbs, or find the mo master of arithmetic to show you how to square a triangle. Ask Benedetto Protorini what is the feeling of walking on ice in Flanders. Some of them are a little bit strange. Here it says, describe the thong of a woodpecker. And some of them are purely weird. Go every Saturday to the hot bath where you will find naked men. Or inflate the lungs of the pig to see whether they increase in width and length or only in width. Yet, the most important lesson I drew from his anti-materialistic tendencies, although successful and celebrated for life, he was not motivated by wealth or material possessions. In his notebooks, he decried men who desire nothing but material riches are absolutely devoid of desire for wisdom, which is the sustenance and truly dependable wealth of the mind. His scientific explorations informed his art. He peeled the flesh of the faces of cadavers, delineated the muscles that moved the lips before painting the world's most memorable smile. He filled the organs with wax to understand better their mechanics, complexity and the structure, believing that phenomena that are far from our sight can shine a light to the things we can actually see. He studied the human skulls, made layered drawings of the bones and teeth and conveyed the skeletal agony of Saint Jerome in the wilderness. He explored the mathematics behind the optics, show how the light rays strike the cornea and produce the magical illusions of changing visual perspective in the Last Supper. But there's a dark side of the story of every brilliance. Leonardo's fantasies pervaded everything he touched, his theatrical productions, plan to divert rivers, designs for ideal cities. His lack of discipline and susceptibility to fantasia led him to abandon many of his works, and make us wonder what those projects might become, and remind us that every vision without execution is simply hallucination. 
Yet, his genius was different in a way that we can understand it and learn from. It was based on a simple skills that we can aspire to improve in ourselves, such as curiosity and intense observation. He had an imagination so excitable that he flirted with the edges of the fantasy, which is also something we can try to preserve in ourselves and indulge in our children. At the end of our magnificent journey, we need to draw some conclusions. Am I a Renaissance man or not? And the answer is definitely not. But I took some notes from old man Leonardo and some important lessons that I will be able to take on my further journeys. I should never suffocate childlike curiosity inside me. I should be always aware that I'm standing on shoulders of a giant. And I should be careful spectator of the nature around me and to always take notes as I go forward in my life. At the very end, I should never forget to ask the question why, and even more often, why not? Hey Vlas Vrada here, I hope you really like this episode that we shot in Italy. Uh, tell me, do you think if the modern renaissance man is still possible today? If you're not subscribed, please do so, because every week we're taking you on new and amazing adventures. Until next week, stay tuned and curious, and don't forget, libraries still exist.